you to pick up questions and comments uh, as, as, uh, as you go on. All right, so let me introduce the panel. Let's uh, bring them up to the stage. George Sadowski is from the Internet Corporation for Assign Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN, of course. Um, joining us remotely from uh, Germany is Wolfgang Kleinwachter from Aarhus University. Fiona Alexander from the United States Department of Commerce's National Telecommunications and Information Administration, the NTIA, and from Syracuse University, Mr. Milton Mueller, Professor Milton Mueller. Good to have you all here. Um, I, I'm just by way of a little introduction to me and to set the scene, um, I've been here in Ottawa for a decade reporting on federal politics. It's a big year for reporters in federal politics in Canada. We're going to have an election this year. But before I did that, I spent about 15 years as a tech reporter. I reported on the creation of CIRA and all the issues, et cetera, et cetera. And I just dug up from the archives. This is when I was working for the National Post. Here's something I wrote. Court battles and international confusion have spawned calls for changes to the way top-level domains, such as .com, .net, and in Canada, .ca, are administered. So, after lots of hand-wringing and some heated cyber debate, changes will take place this year. The U.S. government, which supervises the administration of the most popular .com domain and others, is handing the task over to the private sector under the, under the supervision of an independent nonprofit group called the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. In Canada, a volunteer ad hoc committee that runs the .ca domain will be replaced with the Canadian Internet Registration Authority. I wrote that in 1999 that there was confusion and court battles as the U.S. government was prepared to do something. And I've followed some of these folks 15, 20 years ago talking about some of the debates we're about to have on governance, and we're having some of the similar debates, but I'd argue that today is, or this year could be, I think, another big year that it was perhaps in 1999 or the early creation of ICANN and .CIRA. Um, and so let me just start by, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to say a few words. You can look up their bios. Distinguished panelists all, Wolfgang and, and the, uh, up on the screen there. But I'm going to ask each panelist just to say a couple of words about yourself as you think, as you, as you introduce yourself to this group, knowing that they may know a little bit about your work. And after you say a couple of lines about yourself, let's try to get our terms straight, what we're talking about when we say in 2015, internet governance. And uh, Milton, you're sitting closest to me, so I'll give you the first crack at that one, and then we can start arguing as we uh, go around the room. Milton. Sure. Um, so I'm Milton Mueller. I'm a professor at uh, currently at Syracuse University. I'm about to move to Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta. And uh, I've been tracking this uh, internet governance, uh, which we apparently don't know what it means, uh, <laughs> since 1996, uh, when I started looking at the debate over the fragmentation of the DNS root. Um, and uh, I got involved in ICANN, uh, partly as a interested scholar, looking at something very unique and interesting, and partly as an activist, seeing lots of things that were not so good going on that I thought I could, I could help fix. Uh, and I, now I think with the IANA transition, we're reaching a stage where we're finally fixing one of the biggest things I'd like to fix. But what do we mean by internet governance? Well, I don't know what other people mean by it, but I like to use the word global internet governance to distinguish it from internet policy, which is conducted at a national level using traditional tools of regulation by national governments. Uh, what makes the internet interesting and its governance interesting is that it's very distributed. Uh, its operations and policy problems don't get confined to territorial jurisdictions, so we need to have new global institutions like ICANN or the RIRs to, to deal with these problems. So that's what I mean by internet governance. It's the institutional solutions to global problems of policy and coordination posed by the internet. Excellent. Thank you. And Pretty brief and quick. I like that. That's terrific. All right, Fiona, your turn as well. Fiona promised me that she's the shortest answers person here, but let's see if she's generally. Milton and I have these debates where he runs out of time. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So my name is Fiona Alexander. I've been at NTIA, uh, which Byron gave a nice explanation um, a slide of what we do and who we are uh, for the last 15 years. So I've been intimately, uh, both in a pleasant and a painful way, been involved in the debates around internet governance, uh, both in the United States and in the international framework um, around these issues. Um, 
it's been an interesting, fun experience um, seeing the, the formation of ICANN. I was actually interning at NTIA when everything first started, so I have seen the full life cycle and span of this and have an interesting historical perspective from our side in terms of how things have evolved. Um, but it was also very much involved in the World Summit on the Information Society and the five years of negotiations around the world. I should also say that we work very closely at NTA with Industry Canada, and I see Pam is here, and uh, the Industry Canada team and Pam's team, is, we're very much in sync with them and work with them on almost everything, and we always appreciate that effort. Um, so internet governance, what does it mean? Um, so I've had to explain this to a variety of people over a variety of years. Um, just contextually, I'm the civil servant that, that stays and works there regardless of various political iterations of our administration. Um, but internet governance can basically mean what you, what you want it to mean is basically my assessment after all these many years. Um, but my takeaway, and Wolfgang will have an interesting perspective since he was part of a group that was chartered to define internet governance, so his, his explanation will be useful. But for me, it's anything and everything related to the internet. So policy, standards making, social issues, anything that you want to talk about can fall under the rubric of internet governance. And that's part of the challenge of trying to find solutions for people. George. Yes, and that's why it's important to disaggregate internet governance, because I agree with Fiona. It means what you want it to mean, and therefore you can have marvelous discussions about it uh, and uh, not understand how, uh, uh, how the person you're talking about is coming at it. Uh, it le leads to all kinds of confusion. The press is thoroughly confused by this, with the exception, I'm sure, of the moderator. Uh, <laughs> and the, uh, the uh, only... Uh, 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 formal uh, attempt to define internet governance that I know of was at the UN as a result of the WIGIG, uh, where after about a year's worth of discussions, uh, the, uh, the group discussing was locked up in a Spartan monastery outside Geneva and wasn't uh, released until they came up with a discussion. Wolfgang can comment on that. He was one of the people who was locked up. Uh, I'd like to uh, disaggregate internet governance into three layers. This, this is one way of doing it. There are other ways of doing it. Uh, and that is uh, administration, policy, and use. And I'd like to, to make it r more real, I'd like to use a road and highway analogy to do it. Uh, if we want to move people from uh, and goods from one place to another, just like we want to move information from one place to another on the internet. Uh, we need some basic infrastructure. We need roads, we need highways uh, that are passable. Uh, we need some basic rules like uh, drive on the right or on the left, but not, not both. Uh, we need some, no, some understanding that green means go and red means stop, and we need a sprinkling of stop signs and yield signs and other things. And then you have it, and you need addresses. Uh, so that you know where you're going and people know where to find that address. And you probably need an address book in order to relate people's names to uh, the addresses in which they live. And then you've got an infrastructure for going from one place to another. And that's the same thing on the internet uh, where you have standards that are built primarily by the IETF, voluntary standards for the, uh, uh, for, for the operation of the internet. We call them protocols. Uh, you have uh, uh, people who give out numbers. Uh, house numbers in, in the, to, with the analogy, uh, and you have a, a names function which is uh, largely headquartered in ICANN. Above that, there's a policy level. Uh, and for example, uh, do you want your highways to be equal access? Do you want to have special lanes, fast lanes for, uh, for, uh, for people who might be willing to pay more? How are you going to pay for these highways? Do you want toll roads, uh, et cetera? And that is very much in the, the analog to that in the internet space is that of national regulation and net neutrality discussions that we've been having. What kind of an internet do we want? Uh, how do we want it to operate once we have the basic infrastructure? And finally, uh, the usage uh, layer, which is the top layer, is I would consider by far the most important, and that is how is the internet used? What, is, what does governance on the internet look like? We have a disruptive force which has come into our uh, our, our society, uh, and it's changing very much the way in which things are happening. Uh, and uh, we need to know uh, what, what should be the rules for this, if any. If regulation is required, what kind of regulation is required? Why regulate? Uh, there's an enormous amount going on here. Just one example uh, in terms of the economic implication of, of, the, of this usage level. Uh, you have, um, let's see, the largest taxi company in the world is now Uber. It owns no taxi cabs. The largest retailer in the world is Alibaba. It has no inventory. And the largest hotel chain in the world is, uh, what is it? Uh, I keep forgetting this, Airbnb. And it owns no hotel rooms. So major economic change is occurring. And we really better get it right. Thank you. 
All right, thanks, George. And let's uh, let's go to Europe. Wolfgang, you can hear us okay, I trust? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, can you hear me? There's a, probably a delay, but uh, I, I'm very happy to be uh, part of this um, panel. Unfortunately, I'm not in person in Ottawa. I've never been in Ottawa, and uh, I hope there will be another opportunity. So that means um, um, I was indeed part of this group. Uh, who was uh, more or less jailed in the monastery on the Lac Le Mans in 2005 when uh, the Working Group on Internet Governance um, had to come back to the World Summit with a definition what Internet Governance is. And indeed, the definition the Working Group proposed became more or less accepted by the 190 heads of states of the United Nations because nobody had a better idea. So that means the definition which was included into the Tunis agenda of the World Summit on the Information Society in 2005 has a certain broad acceptance. And while I agree with Fiona, George, and also Milton that everybody has its own definition, uh, the definition which is in the Tunis agenda has the um, broadest recognition and insofar it's worth to look into the details of this definition. This is only, you know, four or five lines, a very short one, but it has three important elements which are still very relevant uh, for today's and tomorrow's uh, discussions about the future of the governance of the Internet. The first element is uh, about the actors. So the problem was before the Tunis um, uh, summit, uh, who should take the lead in governing the internet? Should it be governance? Should it be the private sector or the technical community or whatsoever? And the result in the proposed definition is that the internet does not need a leader. It needs the involvement of all stakeholders, governments, private sector, civil society, but also the technical academic community. So that means the idea of the multi-stakeholder approach came out from this definition. And I think this has been proved by the discussions in the last 10 years that the internet is such a phenomenon which cannot be managed by one stakeholder group alone. So that means governments, private sector, the civil society and the technical community has to work hand in hand. As Milton has said, it's a decentralized network. S st different stakeholders have a different role. That's why we have added in the definition in their respective roles. That means civil society cannot substitute the private sector. The private sector cannot substitute the governments. The governments cannot substitute the technical academic community. That it means each of the stakeholders have a special role, but say they have to work hand in hand. And this leads to the second part of the definition, which speaks about shared norms, principles, and uh, decision-making procedure. So the catchword for this second part of the definition is sharing. I think if you go back to the history of the internet, so it started with sharing resources. So that means people uh, had limited resources and uh, wanted to broaden their opportunities by sharing the resources. And this philosophy of sharing is a basic um, a pillar for uh, each concept uh, related to the governance of the internet. Sharing in both policy development and decision making. And here comes the problem. Because while policy development as an open and transparent process can be done uh, rather easily in a multi-stakeholder environment, and we have good experiences, and the last experiences are related to the NTIA, uh, um, uh, to the Yana transition discussion, which is a unique experience, you know, how policy can be developed in a multi-stakeholder environment. The complicated uh, part comes with decision-taking, because we uh, here we have um, also um, a number of different legal issues involved. Uh, that means decisions taken by governments lead to laws and uh, internet governmental treaties. Uh, decision making by the technical community leads to certain standards. So the private sector and the civil society have their own decision making procedures. So to bring this together and to share decision making 
this is really a challenge for the future and here we have to move forward in this uncharted territory or as Bill Clinton has told us a couple of years ago in San Francisco, this is stumbling forward in uncharted waters. So that means we have to be creative, inventive uh, and, and come with innovation also with policy. I think this is what Kofi Annan told us in the week that he said we have a lot of innovation in technology but only little innovation in policy. So this is the field for innovation in policy. And uh, let me conclude in this first intervention with the final part of the definition, which, uh, which made this differentiation between uh, the evolution and the use of the internet. This uh, more or less uh, supports what George has said, that you know the evolution of the internet, this is more the technical part of it, the infrastructure, names and numbers, the uh, uh, critical resources, while the use of the internet, this is related more to the public policy processes and um, the, uh, the, the problem is that um, these two things are on the one hand a different thing. So the technical issues are, you know, a very specific uh, issues, you know, which have, uh, have been developed mainly, you know, within the uh, circles of the IETF and the uh, regional internet registries, ICANN and others, so mainly technical bodies, while the public policy issues, the use of the internet, this is mainly in the hands of government. So what we have learned in the last 10 years is that it's difficult to separate the technical from the policy issues because uh, policy issues have technical implications and technical issues have policy implications. So this is also a challenge for a new um, collaboration among governmental and non-governmental stakeholders if it comes to um, uh, the governance uh, of the internet. And uh, I think here is where the future begins. So uh, Byron in his opening remarks mentioned already the VSIS 10 plus process and the NTIA transition. So the NTIA transition or YANA transition, that's a little bit like the microcosm, the um, technical uh, questions, while the VSIS 10 plus, this is the macrocosm, these are the public policy issues. And as we have seen, these two things are interrelated and it will need a lot of diplomatic skills to treat them separately, but to understand the interlinkage. Thank you. All right, thank you, Wolfgang. That's terrific. And Wolfgang, um, if you want to just add a comment to some of the other things panelists are making, just put your hand up beside your head. I'll be able to see that, and I'll flag I in. And, and, and I, there you go, perfect. And I'll say the same for the panelists. If you want to quickly amplify. Um, let me start then on, 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 on with Fiona for this next question. Um, all of you have deep experience, long experience with a lot of the issues around internet governance. Our politicians, which are important players, change every couple of years. You've got the U.S. Congress looking in on this situation, uh, and we're all sparked here because of the NTIA's decision to sort of vacate the stewardship role. Give us a sense, once Al Gore left town and after he'd have entered the internet, how are the politicians doing in Washington right now? Do they feel good about this process? Are they comfortable with its pace, the terms under which the NTIA is going to get at this? Give us, give us the latest from D.C. So um, every stakeholder group, including Congress or parliamentarians, no one's monolithic. So um, nothing I could say could represent the broad wrath of, of, of congressional interests. But I think, um, you know, from our perspective at NTIA, we made our announcement last year, and it really is the final step in a 15, maybe now 17 year long process to complete this privatization and do this transition. Um, when we made our announcement last March, uh, some people in Congress were concerned. They weren't quite sure what this was all about. Uh, they, even though they've passed um, resolutions over the years supporting the multi-stakeholder approach and how this works, they weren't quite sure who are all these multi-stakeholders and what does this mean. And I think there were a fair number of questions, and I think that's to be expected, um, uh, not just in any political environment, just about, of anyone that's not involved in this as deeply as we all are. Um, and I think since we made our announcement last year, we've had a variety of congressional hearings, uh, which are all webcast. You can all watch for entertainment value if you'd like. Um, and uh, we've been engaged with them, so has a lot of the U.S. domestic and international stakeholders. And I think since that announcement last year, when there were some questions about why are you doing this and is this the right time, we've now seen a shift to, okay, make sure you do it correctly. And I think that's kind of a, a good testament to the good work that people have, have done. I mean, we made this announcement, we laid out broad conditions. Um, we thought it was better, as opposed to NTIA or the U.S. government unilaterally deciding things to let the stakeholders decide amongst themselves. 
um, with sort of a framework of what we were looking for to build the model and to use it as a test of the system. And you know, the amount of work that people like Milton and others have spent and hours on phone calls, and I just honestly don't know how everybody does so much of this in addition to their regular day jobs, Byron and others, um, and the quality of the work that's coming out I think has brought a lot of comfort to people in Washington that we're gonna do this and do this correctly. So again, I think, um, again, it's not a monolithic congressional viewpoint, because I don't think that ever exists, but <laughs> I think we've definitely seen a shift of just make sure you do it correctly. Wolfgang, I want to come to you, because I, what, part of my day job now, I travel around with our prime minister when he goes uh, to various summits, and some of this stuff comes up on the margins of, say, a G20 summit. And very often, the EU, the EC, European countries have different views about intellectual property, about uh, monopoly, uh, you know, monopolists in, in any market. What's your sense how what's going on in European capitals uh, so far as a multi-stakeholder approach to this problem? Uh, what, what's, the, what's the mood in Europe? I guess I'm asking to sum up. Um, the, uh, the good news is that the uh, European Union, both the European Council and the European Parliament, have adopted resolution which support the multi-stakeholder approach to internet governance. I think the European governments understand that uh, even if some governments would like to have a very specific role for governments, they cannot do it alone. The problem comes if uh, this uh, general statement uh, for support of the multi-stakeholder approach has to be translated in concrete policy decisions. And here we will see uh, probably in the future, you know, as some, um, some uh, different approaches among various members also of the European Union. So while in the northern part of Europe, the uh, Scandinavian countries are more enthusiastic about the multi-stakeholder approach, there are some other member states of the European Union which do not have this um, um, uh, positive approach and want to have a bigger role of the, uh, of the governments. So interestingly, the uh, G7 summit, which took place just last week in Germany, in Elmau, uh, did not uh, uh, cover the internet governance at all. Uh, and I think the uh, uh, heads of states were very wise not to do this alone because to discuss internet governance issues seriously needs the involvement of all stakeholders. What will happen with the BRICS summit, which comes uh, brings together the uh, China, Russia, uh, uh, India, South Africa, and Brazil in uh, early July in Ufa will be a different story. And we will have the G20 summit in Turkey in, uh, in, in fall. So all this probably could lead to a situation in the General Assembly of the United Nations in December that some governments, you know, will uh, push for a more um, stronger role of governments also in overseeing the technical aspects and another group of governments will be more in favor of the multi-stakeholder model. So this could be an interesting political constellation and I hope that uh, the uh, majority um, of the, uh, uh, not only the stakeholders but also the governments uh, has learned the lessons from the last 10 years that whatever uh, you can say about uh, the, 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 the gaps and, and, and uh, also problems with the Internet. The last 10 years has been a success story, and it has been a success story for the Internet because it was managed based on the multi-stakeholder model. So that means if you want to change the system, you risk to stop this innovation uh, and to move backwards. So that means um, uh, this could lead to a, a serious conflict in December, but we hope we are sailing forward and not backwards after uh, December 2015 in New York. Um, I want to ask a question, of, put the same sort of question to both Milton and George, because uh, a lot, I mentioned that at the beginning, I, I was writing in 1999, 1995 about many of the issues we're still talking about today, and you guys, of course, are around uh, back for a lot of that early stuff. Give me a sense of the... the the, the internet, to my lay view, is, it, it has worked. I mean, it's working. It's great. We've got billions using the thing. But we do have Brazil, Russia, India, China. Lots of people coming online, lots of demands. They want to be part of the governance story. So Milton, let me start with you. If you can, would you make the, would you argue to the BRICS, hey, by and large, things have worked. We just need to tinker. Or is the arrival of all these new players, new values of different governments means we need a major rethink. And George, while well, Milton answers, I'm gonna something similar to you. What, what, what do you think, Milton? Time for a major rethink? You, you said 
one of the biggest things I'd like to fix. I'm going to ask maybe in your opening remarks. I don't know what the biggest thing you'd like to fix is, but maybe this is a chance to. Well, the biggest thing was the, the U.S. role, uh, the special unilateral role in which the U.S. was perceived as the controller or oversight authority for ICANN, not for the Internet, but for ICANN. And uh, this was kind of contradicting the multi-stakeholder model. On the one hand, the U.S. was telling uh, the rest of the world, let's keep governments out of this process. Uh, the coordination functions of the Internet should be run uh, by the Internet community itself in a multi-stakeholder model. But on the other hand, the U.S. had a special position within that. So we reached a decision point where we finally had to say, are we going to multilateralize that function that the U.S. government does, or are we going to get rid of it entirely? And it seems like the NTIA has made the correct decision, and they said, we're going to get out entirely. Now, within the framework of uh, ICANN, domain names, IP addressing, I think the, the private sector-based institutions are fairly well entrenched and are not going to be overturned by the ITU. I think the real threat uh, here comes not from direct challenges to the multi-stakeholder model, but from a growing process of nationalization that is incurring not only in the BRICS, but in the United States, in Europe. Um, think of all the nationalistic movements that are happening now in Europe, the, the, the possible rejection of the European Union by certain states. Think of the uh, filtering of content by, by nations uh, think of uh, cybersecurity initiatives which involve the vetting and control of standards for communication and equipment by governments, which includes the U.S. government. I mean, we run uh, the uh, certain kinds of transactions through something called CFIUS, the Committee for Foreign Investment in the United States, and uh, if we don't like Huawei equipment being purchased by somebody, uh, we uh, don't allow them to use that kind of equipment. Uh, the, we think about the role of the NSA in sort of uh, running uh, surveillance programs that are focused on uh, you know, foreign entities and on the United States, and why wouldn't other governments want to imitate or duplicate that power if they can get away with it? So those are the real threats. I think in some ways the overemphasis on ITU versus ICANN, multi-stakeholder versus multilateral is detracting from the fact that we live in a world of nation states that are very powerful, they control guns, they control taxes, and they are gradually asserting more power. And it's not just Russia, it's not just the BRICS, it's every state. Mm -hmm. George, I want to maybe just fine tune that a little bit in this sense, because you've had a long history with the technical creation of the internet, some of that stuff. And one of the things that struck me is when I, when I used to cover this was everybody seemed to know each other back in the day. Everybody did time at Xerox Park or at mm -hmm. Bell Labs. They all went to the same school. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, there's engineers that you certainly would never have heard of. You may never have met in China, in Russia, in mm -hmm. Scandinavian companies. Is there, you know, at, at the IETF or any other form, is there that level of trust? Do people come at technical problems with the same values around openness and transparency mm -hmm. of their work? Maybe you can... Coming to that as a particular yeah. challenge. Well, the, the technical level of the Internet, this, this bottom level of Internet governance, which I'd call administrative, uh, an administrative layer rather than a governance layer, uh, when it was run by the, by the techies, it was very apolitical. Uh, and this is true, I think, of the scientific community generally in the world. Politics is... Uh, which was a political position of its own, being apolitical. Pardon me? Which was a political position of its own, being apolitical. Absolutely. A absolutely. Uh, so that the, the, the technical uh, aspects of the Internet have always been uh, uh, essentially apolitical. Uh, the, the test for an Internet standard, the IETF, is, is there general consensus that it's a good voluntary standard and does it work? And if it does work, uh, then it's put, in, it's put into the set of standards and is available for use. I, I'd contrast this, by the way, if we're talk, as long as we're talking about standards, with the way that uh, the international community deals with standards through the uh, International Standards Organization, the IOS, where you have to have unanimity among 190-some governments in order for a standard to, uh, to take place. And there was such an effort in the networking community, the um, uh, Open Standard for Internet Connect, which was uh, an, an Internet Standards Organization output in the late 1980s. It took about 10 years, and its adoption has, was uh, uh, modest, if not minimal, and it has, I, I believe, essentially been phased out. Governments aren't agile. 
the technical community is agile, the technical community is apolitical, so we have, at the level of internet administration, we really haven't gotten into the political arguments that would dominate, say, in a UN context. And Fiona, I'm, I, I know I'm not going to put you on the spot. I recognize you're a civil servant, not necessarily a policy. You're not a, you're not a politician. But sometimes it's been my experience that politicians here in Canada, politicians certainly in the United States, have not liked the apolitical aspect of the people who are developing all these things. And they do think that America's values, values around democracy, blah, 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 ought to be baked into the internet. I don't know if that is still a going, is there still some rumblings among the politicians? Are they going to look for that? Or what's your sense if that's at all a going concern? So I don't think that's a concern that's specific to politicians or government officials. Um, I think that's specific, that's a concern that's shared amongst the people that feel ownership in the creation of the internet. So, um, you know, as George is talking about in terms of the IETF and the open standards process, what we've been doing at NTA, not just with ICANN, by the way, we've tried to apply this multi-stakeholder approach to privacy and cybersecurity and a few other things, um, and it's difficult in a policy environment, but the idea is to take the underlying core engineering principles of the internet, openness, transparency, participatory nature, consensus building, and apply those standards or those work methods um, to other issues, and it's difficult. So I think this idea that um, baking it in is probably true, but I'm not sure that that's a political thing. I think that's actually a function of the how the internet was first set up and created. And from my perspective at MTIA, we're trying to respect those origins and apply those same standards across. And it has its moments because um, people believe in this approach. And I should also add, it's not the goal here is not to develop a multi-stakeholder system or a multi-stakeholder model. The multi-stakeholder model is a tool. The, tool, the, the goal here is economic development, free expression, broader economic growth. That's what this is all about. It's not about creating an institution. It's not about taking the US government out. It's not about giving control to Russia. It's about how do you get more people online? How do you have economic growth, free expression, these kinds of things? So that's the bigger picture. Our perspective is that the best way to do that is to have everybody involved and do it along the lines of the way that respects the way the internet was developed. And that's what this is about from our perspective. But, you know, people support the multi-stakeholder model until they don't get what they want. And that's not just governments, right? That's all stakeholder groups. And that's part of the challenge. And the hard part for people to accept is that sometimes in this approach, you don't get 100% of what you want. And while at NTA, we're willing to accept that as an outcome, not all governments are. And quite frankly, not all stakeholder groups are either. So um, I don't think it's a specific government challenge. George. Yeah, the the multi-stakeholder model is really in its infancy. Uh, and uh, although it's been practiced informally among groups for a, for a long time. And uh, what we're seeing in ICANN, for example, is an instantiation of the multi-stakeholder model. Uh, and it changes over time. We've already had one major reorganization of ICANN. Uh, we're about to go through something which uh, it will be significant, if not major. Uh, and so we're, it's, we're learning as we go. Uh, and there are all kinds of unanswered questions. How are the stakeholders determined? What determines the entry of a new stakeholder? Should there be equal, an equal footing? rule or are some stakeholders more important than others for perfectly valid reasons? Uh, we're working that out as we go. It's a promising uh, uh, technique and uh, uh, it, um, let's see, I, I'm reminded of the um, uh, quote by Winston Churchill that uh, democracy is a terrible form of government uh, except compared to all others. And I think that is, is appropriately applied to multi-stakeholderism vis-a-vis multilateralism in this case. Uh, Wolfgang, let me come to you again. Obviously, let's focus the discussion on the issue at hand, which is, in a few months, something's supposed to happen. The NTI, I think it's September, is it not? That it's sort of the rough deadline wants to... No, there's no deadline. No deadline, all right. Um, in, in any event, Wolfgang, I want to come to you to say, how does this happen? What, what, are the, what do you see as the key issue as the NTI sort of gets out of this stewardship space? Uh, you know, we have, let me first make a comment to what George just has said when uh, he spoke about the multi-stakeholder model. Indeed, there is no model. So what we have learned in the process is that we have to identify the issues and then to build the governance specific model around the issue. So we have to deal case by case and then to find the very specific model for each of the very individual cases. That means the governance of names and numbers 
could be rather different from the governance of privacy, the governance of uh, e-commerce, or the governance of uh, net neutrality, or things like that. So uh, I think there are some principles which has been outlined by Fiona, uh, open, transparent, bottom-up, uh, you know, participatory, and things like that. So, but the concrete model, you know, how you manage a certain issue does not uh, uh, goes that one size fits all and here you have to model and then you have to push all the details of a solution you know into this model this won't work it's the other way around you have to build the solution around the very specific case and in so far it's a very dynamic process where you have dozens of different uh, individual forms you know how to govern issues if you have dozens of different issues so I think this is the number one. The number two is, um, uh, you know, what about the timetable? So we have, um, you know, uh, just a date uh, because the contract expires on September 30th. And it, uh, it was very clear from the very early beginning, if you read the contract, that there is an opportunity to uh, extend the contract twice for two years. So this would bring us in the year 2019. In my understanding, the US government used the first exit opportunity and to say, if the community is ready to produce something until September 30, then it's fine. So that means we, uh, we would then already be in a position if uh, the proposal uh, matches the criteria we have defined, then we can hand it over. So, but in the process we learned that if we really want to do it in a bottom-up, uh, open, trans uh, participatory way, this is much more time-consuming. And it's, it's very understandable that a multi-stakeholder process is more time-consuming than a one-stakeholder process. And, you know, it's already difficult, you know, if the government as one stakeholder group has to negotiate, you know, and, and, and this takes uh, months and sometimes years. So, and here you have to bring uh, four stakeholder groups into a process. So this is time consuming. And uh, what we have uh, uh, learned also from statements by Fiona and Larry Strickling is that, that there is no deadline, so we are waiting. Uh, we have an opportunity to uh, have this in, in probably in various phases. So uh, there is probably no need to extend the contract on September 30 for two years. If we could just try to do it uh, within six months, uh, looking into the interim results, then probably uh, we can give you additional six months and then we can reach it until March 30. So this is an, uh, an option and this will depend from the progress we uh, uh, can reach now in Buenos Aires. So that means next week in Buenos Aires there is a rather important ICANN meeting where all the groups, uh, in particular the uh, group which deals specifically with the transition and all the three subgroups, have a meeting and then then uh, it's up to them, Milton is a member of this group, uh, to uh, you know, draft a first proposal. And uh, this proposal has to be stress tested, it has to match the criteria. And for my reading is that uh, if a proposal is ready uh, until the end of the year, then this would be um, enough time for the um, uh, NTIA to uh, consider this proposal and to get uh, probably, if needed, uh, green light from the Congress so that the whole process could be um, finished, at least in its first phase, until March 30. So this is a very optimistic timetable. If this fails, probably we have to wait until 217 or until 219. But this could have unintended side effects. So this could be seen as an uh, uh, you know unsatisfactory uh, process by some other governments, and then uh, this could trigger processes. Milt mentioned already that uh, some governments say we have to go uh, more towards our so-called national internet sector. The yeah. Wolfgang was. Yeah, it, the, the connection between ICANN and the U.S. government is, is small and uh, tenuous. It's a couple of functions. Uh, the U.S. government has never intervened uh, in, uh, in exercising whatever rights it had under those contracts. So we're looking at a very small piece of Internet governance uh, and spending a lot of time doing it. The, the question does arise, however, that if ICANN is not beholden in any way to the U.S. government, to whom is it beholden? In other words, where's the accountability relationship? And that's what we're trying to figure out now in the context of, uh, of the ICANN community, those organizations that are in the ICANN orbit. 
there, there are several issues. There's internal accountability, uh, which uh, is uh, uh, to what extent is ICANN Inc. responsible to the community of organizations which work with it? Uh, and there's external accountability. To what extent should ICANN's accountability be directed toward uh, the globe, the people, the three billion internet users that are there now, the two billion that are following? Uh, and uh, to what extent uh, are, is the accountability uh, discussion focusing on them and the global public interest? Thank you. All right, Milton put his hand up for a second, then we'll come to you, Fiona. Oh. I should just clarify, so our relationship with ICANN is twofold. We, like every other government in the world, wants to be our member and a very active member of ICANN's Governmental Advisory Committee uh, with Industry Canada and others, and that will not be changing, post office. All right, thank you. But uh, Milton, you shot your hand up, I think, at the point when George said the U.S. government has never intervened. Uh, and this is a debate I, I knew you were ready to engage with. Yes, go ahead. Well, it's, um, I think it's a tendency uh, for probably good intentions to understate the significance of the relationship to the U.S. government. So here's what is actually happening. Uh, the U.S. government writes the contract. It says this is what the IANA functions are. And then it awards the contract to a particular entity. In this case, it's always been ICANN. Now, the US government could. It hasn't. And uh, the current administration probably wouldn't. But the US administration could write that contract to say, you know, everybody in ICANN has to wear little green hats that say, I'm a big supporter of Barack Obama. Uh, they could write that contract to say, you know, intellectual property interests rule, and you must always bow down whenever a copyright holder enters the room. Uh, there's all kinds of things they could do to that contract. And even if the NTIA doesn't want to do those things, every time they have to renew the contract, there are congressional hearings. And the congressional hearings are very influenced by US-based lobbyists. Mm -hmm. And we've just seen this with how is the dot sucks domain getting connected to the IANA transition? Why is that happening? What do they have to do with each other? Well, fundamentally, nothing. But they're getting connected because, as Fiona said, everybody likes the multi-stakeholder process until they don't get what they want out of it. And some people didn't like the sucks domain. So they're saying, look, ICANN is bad. We can't give them the responsibility. We can't do this privatization. So you have all kinds of political games played around the renewal of the IANA contract. And uh, that's, you know, I think we're, we're leaving that behind. I really think we are. But uh, let's not understate uh, and trivialize the importance of that relationship historically and at the present time. Uh, hold on a second, George. I just want to maybe, again, because I'm coming back to some discussions that I used to be more involved in, so for, this, this is a dumb question, but maybe a bit of an institutional checkup. Is ICANN the appropriate receptacle for whatever authorities are going to be transferred to it? Are there some new institutions that should be created? Where does the UN, if ever, uh, fit in with this? A G20, some of these other... Well, multilateral, multi-stakeholder organizations. Yeah. Do you want to start on that and then we'll sort yeah. of work down the line? That's the debate we've been having, basically, is when you take the U.S. government out, what fills the accountability vacuum? And it's been an incredibly fascinating debate. Well, is, let me put you on the spot. Is ICANN the appropriate group to take that? It looks like ICANN is the only acceptable one, the only one that can get consensus. Pe many people are afraid of any kind of a major rearrangement. Mm -hmm. They don't know, you know, the devil you know better than the devil you don't know. And so let's do all these things to make ICANN more accountable, but let's have some structural separation of the IANA functions. We succeeded in getting that. Uh, let's have uh, a, a, a very strict limits on ICANN's mission and scope. Let's have a strengthened independent review process, and let's have membership uh, that has some uh, control over the change of fundamental bylaws in ICANN. So we're introducing new accountability mechanisms. Uh, it doesn't appear like any arrangement that would involve fundamental radical changes in the system would be able to get a consensus among the people involved. George, can I put the same issue to you? Is ICANN the right place? The institutional checkup, everything working? I think so. Right. Uh, I disagree with Milton on this. I, I agree with his general comments uh, that we need to look at accountability. We need to understand what's involved and who the uh, who anybody who is administering a piece of the internet, which is a critical internet resource, uh, uh, what the, who they're accountable to. Uh, but uh, the, the, me the mechanisms are still to be worked out, and there are issues. I, we're, I'm following, Milton is involved in, in creating this. I'm following reading what comes out and, and trying to understand what the implications are. We have a ways to go. 
Uh, Wolfgang mentioned, uh, I want to put this to you, Milton, uh, the issue on timeline. Is this September 30th too ambitious? Is the I think Wolfgang's phrase, the community may not be ready this fall. Give me your thoughts. Community ready in the spring? Community ready in 2019? Community ready ever? <laughs> you know. Well, I think uh, the spring estimate that Wolfgang gave was uh, pretty much in line with what I see happening right now. Uh, the September 30th deadline is not, it's not a deadline, it's a goal. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. It's a statement of fact. It's when the base period it's, expires. That's right. Yes. When the contract expires. So if, mm -hmm. if we're not ready by then, and we won't be, probably won't be ready by then. Actually, it's still technically possible that we could be, but it depends on how quickly NTIA can process what they're given, and we have no idea how that works. Uh, and it, there's a lot of uh, random intervening variables, i.e. Congress, that uh, could uh, gum up the works. But fundamentally, I think that we are about five months behind the original goal of September 30th, and that uh, I think it would be quite possible for us to be uh, to, to execute the transition in, in March or April of next year. And Fiona, maybe I'll get you to ask. Uh, one of the, again, I'm going to draw on what Wolfgang said. He thought that this was the NTIA's, I think his phrase was, the first opportunity of exit, uh, essentially. But give me your sense on timelines from the NTIA standpoint. Could something happen? Do you think realistically by September 30th, if, if tomorrow? Uh, everybody said, sure, here's the package, go ahead and take a look at it, or, or it's going to take a little time. So um, we recently, um, my boss recently sent a letter, maybe about two or three weeks ago, to the to the chairs of the two work streams. There's a group on the, uh, the Milton's part of the ICG, which is looking at the technical piece, and then there's a group looking at ICANN's accountability. And we sent the same letter to both groups, first of all, thanking them for all their hard work, and then saying um, September 30th is fast approaching, it doesn't look like we're going to be ready, how much more time do you all need? Because I think people have to keep in mind the proposal has to get agreed to. There has to be a broad record of public support and consensus behind the proposal. It has to come to us for evaluation. And then it has to be implemented before we can let the contract expire. So can all that happen before September 30th? Based on the proposals on the table, I think that's probably not the case. Okay. Um, but again, you know, we've asked the community how much more time do they need. And I think, um, I think it's fair to say people have been frustrated with us in various ways through this process, but we've tried to be very careful about not intervening and not dictating one way or the other. People have asked us to say one thing or another, and we really are asking the community to come to consensus and come up with have what... you had to bite your lip from time to time? You may have, I'll bet. But... And you're biting your lip right now. Correct. Yes. <laughs> um, but it's, it's really important. I mean, I think... Um, People have a, sh I mean, it's, I think, I don't know if it's the internet or technology, but people's history and attention to history is very short in this space. People forget what it was like five years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago at ICANN. And you look at the ITU, which just celebrated its 150th anniversary this year and the rules of procedure that govern it that were developed 150 years ago and how that institution has survived. <laughs> and people look at ICANN today and they look at the internet governance ecosystem of today and assume it's always been that way. 17 years ago, it was not this way. And I think people lose sight of, they get lost in the issue of the day and the fight of the day, and they lose sight of all that's been achieved. Because I think George got to this point, this idea of a multi-stakeholder approach, while it's not gonna break and destroy the Westphalian state system, it is definitely a different way of doing things. And you know, getting people to agree to it and getting governments to participate and show up and accept it has taken time. And for those of us that sit in UN meetings and get yelled at for 16 hours at a time defending the model, it's easy for someone that's outside of that to say there's no risk to the system. But things have evolved over time. And the system gets a lot of credit for making that evolution. During the WISIS process, when Wolfgang was involved in this definition, and we were debating, is this the right approach? I think there was a question, would people be willing to accept ICANN? No one is now saying, is ICANN going to go away? It's, how's it going to evolve? How is it going to change? And that was not the case, even in 2005. And people lose sight of that. And I think ICANN, to its credit, and the IETF, to its credit, have done a lot to make it more open to governments and more open to other stakeholders. And you know, again, I think the system itself has evolved and is provi proving itself to be resilient, but you shouldn't assume it's going to be this way unless you're committed to making it this way. And that's what this transition has been about, which is getting everyone to take the time and energy to buy into the system, and you only get the best solution when everyone's involved. Um, Wolfgang, let me uh, maybe just turn the conversation a little bit, because you sparked some interesting ideas in, in your last intervention. As we think about institutions involved in this whole space, ITUs, ISOCs, uh, you know, ITUs, ICANs, you name it, 
Are there some that need some institutional rejigging? So that's the first part of this question. And then, should the UN be involved? Should the G7 be involved? Should the G20 be involved? You name the international fora. Are there some groups that might cause more harm to the process by getting involved now? And here I'm thinking about your comment about the G7. Some groups should stay out of it at this point, or is it time to bring some new institutions in and rejig some institutions? Big question. Uh, yes, you know, the best um, um, answer to this is nobody should be excluded. That means if somebody has uh, identified a stake or interest, he should join the broader community. The problem is that in our day-to-day uh, -day thinking, we always want to have, you know, one person, one institution in charge. We want to have one telephone number. Remember when Kissinger uh, was criticizing Europe because he said, you know, I do not have one telephone number when I can call Europe, so I have to call in Paris, London, or uh, Berlin. Um, so, and this is with the internet. There is no single leader. Uh, it would be nonsense to say, the internet should be governed by the United Nations. But on the other hand, the United Nations and the number of committees and working groups in the United Nations, you know, can make a contribution in their respective roles to a certain aspect. So the problem is how to bring all this multi-layer, multi-player mechanism into a certain balance uh, that we can uh, stumble forward and can do that, what Fiona has said, you know, to create a space where we have more innovation, more economic growth, and the respect of human rights. I think this is, uh, it's about the, the substance and these are the three big things. So we want to hand, enhance our security. Uh, we want to have uh, economic growth and innovation. We want to have uh, uh, human rights. And so we have to create um, uh, uh, conditions that this is enabled. And so a lot of institutions are, are, are able uh, to make contributions. Uh, this starts within the governmental organizations in the UN system, but also the OECD, the Council of Europe, the Asian uh, uh, intergovernmental organizations, all they deal with the issue and can make a contribution. The problem is if one of these institutions wants to become the king or the, uh, the, the, the rule maker for the internet. So if he goes beyond this concept of sharing, if he wants to do it alone, this will fail and that's the risk. So the same as I can. I can is not the governor of the internet. I can play an important role and what has been said also in the discussion, it has to be uh, accountable to uh, in particular if the US leaves its role. But these are minor things which can be fixed. I can is a great place. The IETF is a great place. The ISOC is a great place and also the ITU is a great place if they, the ITU concentrates on infrastructure development. So, um, uh, but if ITU would say, okay, we are the ruler of the internet, then uh, we have a problem. And so far, we have to learn uh, how to live with a distributed system where uh, we have, uh, you know, dozens of different organizations working hand in hand and nobody rules it alone. Milton, you popped your hand up for a second and then we'll come to George. Yeah, a bit of a... a a different perspective than Wolfgang from me. Uh, it actually relates to a pretty fundamental uh, principle, which is uh, I can't accept a notion uh, of the multi-stakeholder model. Uh, there, there is no the there. There's uh, various kinds of institutional arrangements. And the, idea, the problem with just saying, oh, everybody's a stakeholder, everybody should be involved, is that it ignores the power differentials that different stakeholders have or that the different institutional arrangements give them. So I think you the, mentioned earlier, nations have guns and money. Exactly, and, and, and so the, the key yeah. distinction here with multi-stakeholderism is not that one is multi and the other is not. The distinction is their relationship to states, and either we are creating an alternative globalized governance regime that is independent of the state system, or we are not. And th there's no sort of middle ground there in the sense that you can have, like ICANN currently does not allow governments to appoint board members, which is a good thing because you'd set in motion a power struggle about which governments were represented. It would be the UN Security Council. Before you know it, you've got the UN Security Council, right. So, so the good thing about so-called multi-stakeholderism is that it holds the state system at bay. It tries to get input and some kind of uh, role definition for governments. It doesn't completely pretend that they don't exist, but the key feature of it is that it does uh, keep them out 
of the global governance precisely so that it will be global and not territorial and not geopolitical. George. Yeah. Well, where the governments can make a difference, of course, is in uh, harmonizing policies across uh, national boundaries and international relations. I would take the um, Council of Europe Cybercrime Convention as, as an example of that. Uh, I, I don't mean to trivialize the ad internet administration layer of this multi-layer model of internet governance, but I, I do think that uh, we spend a lot of time on it. It's important to get it right, but the problems, the real problems are elsewhere, and I'd like to raise one. Um, in the Globe and Mail, uh, about three or four days ago, there was a very nice article by Gordon Smith uh, on the Internet of Things. I don't know how many of you saw it, but uh, what he said was, I'll take the, uh, the, the example he gave, he said, my toothbrush has Bluetooth networking capability. Uh, and he said, that's fine. Um, if I don't brush my teeth for two minutes twice a day, is my dental insurance carrier going to refuse to uh, pay for my next cavity filling? And uh, I mean, that's uh, sort of facetious, but it's real. Uh, and, and I suspect that uh, w within a couple of years, we'll have dental insurance plans saying, if you brush your teeth twice a day for, for two, uh, uh, two minutes, you, we'll give you a 10% reduction in your premium. The point is that there are things going on in the policy space which are uh, uh, much larger than this and much more important than, than br brushing teeth, but that it reflect on how the policy layer of internet governance should be structured and how, if there are any repercussions on the technical layer. And those are large Larger questions, they take longer to, uh, to work out, but ultimately I think they're the most important. Is that really internet governance? It is the way a lot of people refer to it. Sounds Absolutely. Like, sounds like healthcare governance to me. Yeah, yeah, it's governance on the internet, and it's the result of the internet invading uh, just about every social uh, space we have today. I, I want, we've got a few minutes left in this particular panel. It's been a great discussion. I've really enjoyed it. Um, and I maybe want to just sort of go around the horn with uh, just Byron's task today was, as Canadians, uh, think through some of these principles of governance, objectives uh, that, we w that maybe Canadians want to consider as they lend their support. Obviously, Canadians have been very supportive of generally the United States position, but um, some principles, problems, uh, pitfalls, potential blind spots, um, if you have some things to close there. And Wolfgang, I'll come to Europe to start with you. I'll give these guys a, a quick break and put this thought in your head again, if you've got a minute or two there. Um, you know, my conclusion from the discussion the last 10 years is that good internet governance starts at home. But it means if we uh, discuss the multi-stakeholder model on the global level, we have to ask us what we are doing at home. Uh, at home, we have established institutions, we elect a parliament, we have a government, but we have also in uh, many countries a developed civil society, a technical community and the private sector. So the um, multi-stakeholder culture uh, could be advanced and further uh, developed if we start a new uh, collaborative culture um, in, um, in the nation states. Uh, that means we have a good example in Brazil, where we have the CGIBR, which has created already 10 years ago a uh, multi-stakeholder body, and today this body, you know, uh, regardless of the existing governance structures like the Senate and the government, you know, make a tremendous contribution to the development of national policy. So we have uh, done now um, a, a similar approach in Germany where we uh, brought together all stakeholders and produced a paper which was not uh, a governmental paper for the Yana transition, but where the governments were part of a discussion process and joined the paper, which was driven also by the non-governmental stakeholders. So if there is uh, one recommendation for Canada is, you know, try to uh, be innovative and form new multi-stakeholder bodies um, within a country. And if we have enough uh, good national experiences, probably, uh, probably we can internationalize this, and this could make a contribution contribution to a more enhanced multi-stakeholder system in five or ten years from now. Wolfgang, thank you. Okay, uh, George, I'll come back down this way. I subscribe, I subscribe to Wolfgang's model. In Internet government starts at home. I think that's a great uh, way to uh, encapsulate uh, the correct way to go. Uh, the IGF, 
uh, Internet Governance Forum was set up 10 years ago for people from all countries to uh, get together and talk about problems on the Internet. And the, uh, one, one of the issues with the IGF is that I think they mix these layers of Internet governance and, uh, and somehow it's difficult to focus and, and, and choose the right institutions or the right directions for solving problems at, at specific levels. Whereas national IGFs or national Internet policy uh, is, much more is much more tractable because you have a homogeneous uh, community, more or less. You have one government. Uh, you, have, you have a set of laws that are common across uh, the entire country. That's where good Internet policy can be made at all levels. Uh, and uh, in particular, I, I'd like to come back to, Milton, your comment about toothbrushing and that being Internet governance. Uh, that's a symptom of a very important part of Internet governance. How do we feel about sharing of information how do, uh, on the Internet? How do we feel about confidentiality? Who owns information? Who has the right to get information? Uh, that's at the policy level, and it's bedeviling a lot of us. Uh, different uh, countries have different solutions to that, from the totalitarian to the more libertarian. And that's the policy we need to get right, and then uh, as, while we're doing that, we can argue for some kind of a uh, rough convergence on the international level that will make interna international uh, cooperation more viable with respect to some of these issues, such as cybercrime. All right, uh, uh, Fiona, what, what, uh, what might you say? Of course, as I say, Canada, U.S., very similar, but you probably know this, we Canadians want to be recognized for our own contribution to this debate, but nonetheless, give us a little thoughts. True. Um, so I think why should you care and why should this be important to you? I think everyone takes the current system for granted. It works, it's worked well for you and you think it's gonna continue. Um, and my message to you is it won't continue if you don't get involved and ensure that it continues this way. Um, it's important to work with Sierra and Byron and Industry Canada and Pam and all the different people in uh, Canada that are involved in these spaces to make sure your voice is heard and to make sure the issues are being addressed. I do think that um, when we look at the history of the issues and the last 15 to 17 years, these issues of um, the administrative layer, I think as, as George is calling it, are largely settled. We've got some major you know, adjustments happening at the end with the IANA transition, um, and you know, some changes happening in natural evolutions. These systems are never gonna be static, but I do think these governance of the internet, or on the internet issues, I always get that incorrect, are really where things are shifting, and it's, it's not just your toothbrush data, which I found very creepy when I saw that as well. Um, it's content and content controls and free expression. And these are the issues I think where the international debate is gonna shift and where the focus is changing to. And it's where governments and governments that are more repressive than mine and yours have very strong views. Um, and imposing those views on the internet will then shift back to changing the administrative layer. So again, it's really important. Don't take the world for granted because it's not that way unless you make it that way. Thank you. Milton. Yeah, so I think if you describe, uh, if you ask why uh, Canadians should care about internet governance, my answer would be they shouldn't. They shouldn't. They should not as Canadians. They should care as human beings. Citizens as, of the world. As internet users. Uh, maybe as Ottawans, uh, maybe as Canadians, maybe as Ontarians, um, maybe as uh, members of some ethnic community. Uh, why, why single out Canada, you know? The uh, nation state. The nation state. It's, uh, it's the wrong approach. I disagree with George here. Um, he's talking about essentially a national, relying on national level institutions and then coordinating across them. Well, that's what we did with the telephone system. We ended up with national telephone monopolies, and then we had interconnection through the ITU, through an intergovernmental organization. And the great thing about the internet was it just globalized that in a, in a heartbeat. And we had to develop new institutions to coordinate and to develop policy. And if we, again, if we go towards relying entirely or, or primarily on national institutions for governance on the internet, we will be back in this, this sort of protectionist, fragmented space of the telephone system of the 1970s, in my opinion. So we don't want to do that. We want to, we want to globalize. We want to localize. We want to have a new multi-stakeholder community making policy uh, through new institutions. And uh, I, I see George's antsy to pick up that, but we do have to sort of wrap things at one point. Um, a great discussion, and I, I want to thank uh, Milton, Fiona, George, and, and Wolfgang uh, there in Germany. It's been a tremendous discussion. I know you've given a lot of the group some things to wheel on, some things to talk about. 
uh, when they come from the, uh, back from their break. So uh, to wrap it up, big hand of applause for our panel, please. Okay. Thank you, you all. Okay. So as I say, some, some things to talk about, especially at the end there. There's, you know, some, it's not all hugs and kisses right now. There's still some things to sort out. Uh, we're going to take a 15-minute break, and we're going to come back here for 1045, and we're going to get to work uh, at the tables to uh, talk and, uh, uh, and get the conversation going. Thank you again. My name is Bertrand de La Chapelle, and I'm a member of the ICANN board. In a nutshell, Internet governance is about democracy in the digital age. It's both the establishment of the rules for the infrastructure that supports the Internet, and for the activities that people run on the Internet. Yes, of course. The Internet is an integral part of their life today, and Internet governance defines the rules for that space, and therefore they should be engaged and taking every opportunity to contribute. It's engagement. The best solution to guarantee the freedom on the Internet and freedom of the Internet is that all Internet users are concerned about the freedom and the openness of the Internet. President and CEO of CIRA. Internet governance is really about how and who controls the internet and all of the different organizations within the whole internet ecosystem. All Canadians should definitely be interested in internet governance. 
I mean, internet governance is probably the one thing that touches all our lives on a daily basis. So how it's operated and who's operating it definitely matters. The first solution to the threat to a free and open internet is education. Be aware, understand how it works. Because by understanding and then supporting those of us who are supporting a free and open internet, that will be one of the fundamental ways to protect the way the internet operates today. Hi, I'm Maria Farrell and I'm involved with the Open Rights Group in the UK. Internet governance means people realising that there's a difference between being a shopper and being somebody who's a citizen. So we're not just consumers, we're people who can shape how the internet is going to be in the future. All Canadians need to be interested in internet governance because they care about being able to talk to who they want to, when they want to, and get access to information and be able to, to move freely on the internet, then they need to be involved in internet governance. The threats to the free and open internet are maybe come from governments, might come from companies, but really just come from apathy of people who think that somebody else is going to fix the problem. Hi, I'm Mathieu Vey. I am the CEO of AFNIC. Internet governance is all these decisions that are made every day by all internet actors that really shape what the internet is going to look like in, uh, in the few coming years. All Canadians should be interested in internet governance because it has implications. It has implications on freedom of expression, has implications on economic growth, but also on their relationship with their government. There is a range of solutions, but my favorite one is cooperation. All internet actors must cooperate to preserve a free and open internet. Hi, I'm Byron Holland, President and CEO of CIRA. My name is Bertrand de La Chapelle. I'm Maria Farrell. Hi, I'm Mathieu Vey. I'm Fadi Shahadi, President and CEO of ICANN. Internet governance is really about how and who controls the internet and all of the different organizations within the whole internet ecosystem. Internet governance is about democracy in the digital age. It's both the establishment of the rules for the infrastructure that supports the internet and for the activities that people run on the internet. Internet governance is the multi-stakeholder process by which multiple parties come together to form the standards and policies that enable the internet to work. All Canadians need to be interested in internet governance because they care about being able to talk to who they want to, when they want to, and get access to information and be able to, to move freely on the internet, then they need to be involved in internet governance. All Canadians should definitely be interested in internet governance. I mean, internet governance is probably the one thing that touches all our lives on a daily basis. So how it's operated and who's operating it definitely matters. There is a range of solutions, but my favorite one is cooperation. All internet actors must cooperate to preserve a free and open internet. Like all good things, the internet faces threats. Our job uh, is to do our best to protect this great enterprise. Uh, if we do our best, uh, then we will make sure that these threats go away. My name is Bertrand de La Chapelle, and I'm a member of the ICANN board. In a nutshell, internet governance is about democracy in the digital age. It's both the establishment of the rules for the infrastructure that supports the internet and for the activities that people run on the internet. Yes, of course, 
The internet is an integral part of their life today, and internet governance defines the rules for that space, and therefore they should be engaged and taking every opportunity to contribute. It's engagement. The best solution to guarantee the freedom on the internet and freedom of the internet is that all internet users are concerned about the freedom and the openness of the internet. Hi, I'm Byron Holland, President and CEO of CIRA. Internet governance is really about how and who controls the internet and all of the different organizations within the whole internet ecosystem. All Canadians should definitely be interested in internet governance. I mean, internet governance is probably the one thing that touches all our lives on a daily basis. So how it's operated and who's operating it definitely matters. The first solution to the threat to a free and open internet is education. Be aware, understand how it works. Because by understanding and then supporting those of us who are supporting a free and open internet, that will be one of the fundamental ways to protect the way the internet operates today. Hi, I'm Maria Farrell, and I'm involved with the Open Rights Group in the UK. Internet governance means people realizing that there's a difference between being a shopper and being somebody who's a citizen. So we're not just consumers, we're people who can shape how the internet is going to be in the future. All Canadians need to be interested in internet governance because they care about being able to talk to who they want to, when they want to, and get access to information and be able to, to move freely on the internet, then they need to be involved in internet governance. The threats to the free and open internet are maybe come from governments, might come from companies, but really just come from apathy of people who think that somebody else is going to fix the problem. I'm Mathieu Veil, I am the CEO of AFNIC. Internet governance is all these decisions that are made every day by all internet actors that really shape what the internet is going to look like in, uh, in the few coming years. All Canadians should be interested in internet governance because it has implications. It has implications on freedom of expression, has implications on economic growth, but also on their relationship with their government. There is a range of solutions, but my favorite one is cooperation. All internet actors must cooperate to preserve a free and open internet. Hi, I'm Byron Holland. President and CEO of CIRA. My name is Bertrand de la Chapelle. I'm Maria Farrell. Hi, I'm Mathieu Veil. I'm Fadi Shahade, President and CEO of ICANN. Internet governance is really about how and who controls the internet and all of the different organizations within the whole internet ecosystem. Internet governance is about democracy in the digital age. It's both the establishment of the rules for the infrastructure that supports the internet and for the activities that people run on the internet. Internet governance is the multi-stakeholder process by which multiple parties come together to form the standards and policies that enable the internet to work. All Canadians need to be interested in internet governance because they care about being able to talk to who they want to, when they want to, and get access to information and be able to, to move freely on the internet.